Our final lesson in topic 6a is lesson 6.4, logarithmic functions. In this lesson, we'll graph logarithmic functions as inverses of exponential, and then we'll look for key features as graphing logarithms without recognizing their exponential form first. We're going to start by reviewing a little bit of 6.1. Sketch the graph of f of x equals 2 to the x, and then we'll sketch its inverse. To graph f of x equals 2 to the x, we're just going to make a table. I'll start with 0, and if I plug in 2 to the 0 power, we get an output of 1. Let's plug in 1. 2 to the first power is 2. Let's plug in 2. 2 squared is 4. If I plug in 3, 2 cubed is 8. But if I plug in 4, 2 to the 4th is 16. And that goes off our graph. I'm going to try the other direction now. I'll start with negative 1. 2 to the negative 1 is 1 half or 0.5. Negative 2. 2 to the negative 2 would be 1 over 2 squared, which would be 1 fourth or 0.25. Remember, when we graphed exponential functions in 6.1, we had asymptotes, lines that our graph never approached or crossed over. Actually, they did approach, they just didn't cross over. Please plot these points and let's see if we can determine what some of those terms were back in 6.1. Does this type of graph look familiar? Remember, on that left-hand side, it doesn't cross over the x-axis. Therefore, our asymptote would be y equals 0. As we move to the right and x gets bigger, the function gets exponentially bigger because it's an exponential function. But now let's take a look at the inverse. If we sketch the graph of the inverse first, remember we do that by simply switching the ordered pairs around. 1, 0, 2, 1, 4, 2, 8, 3, 0. 0.5, negative 1, and 0. 0.25, whoops, not a negative there, 0. 0.25, negative 2. Now plot those points and sketch your curve. Your inverse should look something like the red graph. By definition, the inverse of a function is just the reflection over that line y equals x, right down the middle. Would you agree that we have created that inverse graph? I think that looks pretty accurate. The second part's the trickier part, though, writing the equation for the inverse. Remember, to do that, we just write it as y equals, well, I'll start just by writing inverse. We write y equals and then we switch x and y. And we're supposed to solve for y. And if you recall back in 6.1, this is where we actually got stuck. We actually can't get y by itself in this form. How do we account for that? Oh yes, we create a logarithmic function. From here, what we would actually do is just rewrite it in logarithmic form. We write the word log, and the base is 2, so the little sub-base is 2. What do we take the log of? This is where we loop it to the other side. And what does it equal? Look at that. We got y by itself. Uh-oh, I lost my pen for a second. There we go. This is the equation for this logarithmic function. So let's take a look at that in more detail. I'm going to move it over just a little. It kind of got off my graph. There we go. Let's talk about this function. For the inverse, I guess we should have written that, shouldn't we? All right, let's make sure we rewrite that in here, I guess. F inverse, sorry guys, equals log base 2 of x. There we go. For the inverse, what is the domain? Take a look at this. If we go from left to right, notice that arrow at the bottom doesn't go to the left forever. We actually have a boundary at 0. It will go to the right forever, therefore our domain is going to be x is greater than 0, not equal to. Notice we don't actually cross over the y-axis. Our range goes bottom to top, well that arrow will go to the bottom forever, and to the right, that red arrow, it's going to the right, but it's also increasing at the same time. So now for our range, the inverse is all real numbers. Do you remember when we talked about domain and range in chapter 5? 
And when you create an inverse, you switch the domain and range from the original function. That's what we've done here. Notice our x-intercept. We actually have one this time. It's at 1, 0. And if you remember, the y-intercept in the other graph was 0, 1. Ha, they're inverses. Now for our asymptote. The asymptote is different on this one. The asymptote is going to be vertical, straight up and down. Can you tell where the graph won't cross over? It won't cross over the y-axis. That means our asymptote is going to be x equals 0. And we could draw that in, but I'm going to leave it and I'll draw it in on the left-hand side. We're actually going to put some stuff over on that left-hand side before we graph example 2a. Over on the left-hand side, what we're going to do is define a logarithmic parent function. And I know it's kind of hard to read, I apologize for that, but it says y equals log base b of x. b can be any number as long as it's greater than 0 and doesn't equal 1. For any parent function, this is kind of our template. The sketch of any parent function's graph is going to look like our sketch in red over in example 1. It's going to kind of follow right along that y-axis, cross over the x-axis, and then go to the right in a pretty quick fashion. The domain will always be, for the parent function at least, x is greater than 0. The range will always be all real numbers. For a parent function, the x-intercept will always be 1, 0. And the asymptote will be x equals 0. Our graph will never cross over that boundary line. Now, if all we did was graph parent functions, this would be pretty straightforward but you know we're going to translate them and create transformations. Down below, we'll take a look at how that affects the shape of our graph. All right, here's a lot of information on that left-hand column on graphing transformations. You'll know you have a translated or transformed function if you have other things with your original equation. The template for this will look like y equals a times log base b, and now x minus h in parentheses and then possibly a plus or minus k at the end. If you have any portion of this transformation, to get the domain, if you have something in parentheses with x, set that entire thing greater than 0 and solve for x. That will be your new domain. The range will still stay all real numbers, so that's consistent. The x-intercept, notice you're setting the entire equation equal to 0, and solving it. That's going to be kind of an interesting deal. That'll be using our solving rules from 6.3. Your asymptote is going to move left or right depending on if you have something in parentheses with x. Whatever the h value is, is where your new asymptote will go. The a value in the equation will stretch or compress the graph vertically. The h value will move it left and right, and the k value will move the graph up and down. So, let's try a couple of examples. We have g of x and f of x over on the right. For each function, we're going to describe the transformation, stating the domain, range, asymptote, and x-intercepts. We can also describe it in words with the uh, reflection, or the, the a, h, and k values, sorry. And then we'll sketch our graph just by making a table. Let's start with g of x. g of x equals log base 2 of x plus 3. I'm not worried about the log base 2 part. The 2 is just the b value, and the b doesn't alter any of our process. We do have x plus 3 in parentheses. That means the entire graph is going to move 3 to the left. And it looks like that's the only change to whatever the parent function would be. So let's get our key features. Our domain. Since we have something with x, I'm going to set that greater than 0, and solve for x. If I subtract 3, I get x is greater than negative 3. That's our domain. Our range stays consistent, so g of x is going to equal all real numbers. Our x-intercept, remember we set the entire equation equal to 0. Log base 2 of x plus 3 equals 0. This is what we would do in 6.3 when we solved logarithmic equations. The first thing you do is isolate your entire logarithmic term. 
We have that. Second thing we do is we convert it to exponential. Notice our base is 2, so I'm going to start off with a base of 2. Raise it to the power on the right by looping 2 to the 0. Set it equal to that parenthesis equals x plus 3. And now we solve for x. This one's not too bad. 2 to the 0 power equals 1. We know that. So if you set that equal to x plus 3 and you subtract 3 from each side, our x-intercept is negative 2. All right, and the other thing we need to uh, create is our asymptote. And remember, the asymptote is going to be the same value as what h is in the equation, and it's also going to match that value for the domain at the top. If your parenthesis has x plus 3, remember, that doesn't mean h equals 3. It's always the formula x minus h. So if you have x plus 3, our asymptote will actually be at negative 3. All right, we have some information to graph. We'll get that started, and then we'll use a table to find more points. I'm going to first start by sketching the asymptote at x equals negative 3. I'm going to graph that in blue. I'm just going to count over to negative 3 and draw my vertical boundary line. I know we can't cross over that, so we'll get that in place. Other things we know. We know that our x-intercept is at negative 2, right there, plot that point. I think that's all we know for now. So what we'll do is we'll just plug in numbers that will help us sketch our graph. We may have to refer to our power chart to guide us on this function. If we have log base 2, think of two like the two row of all the different types of powers. We know that if we plug in negative 2, our x-intercept is 0. So we have that point plotted on the graph already. As I move to the right, I need to make sure that log base 2, I find numbers that are going to be powers of 2. Let's see if negative 1 works. Plugging in negative 1 in, in for x in the parentheses, negative 1 plus 3 is 2 we would have to try to evaluate log base 2 of 2. And what that means on your power chart is think to yourself, 2 to what power equals itself? That's what this logarithm is asking us to determine. Well, that doesn't seem so bad. 2 to the first power is 2. Therefore, log base 2 of 2 has an output of 1 because 2 to the first power is 1. Now, if we try to plug in 0, 0 plus 3 is 3, and we'd have to evaluate log base 2 of 3. That's a decimal approximation that we'd have to guess and check. Let's try positive 1 and see if that will give us a workable solution. 1 plus 3 in the parentheses is 4. 2 and 4 seem to have a connection. If we want to evaluate log base 2 of 4, again, thinking about your power chart, 2 to what power equals 4. That would be 2 squared. So that output would be 2. Now we have to try to figure out, well, after that, what would be a good number? What, was the, what would be like the next power of 2? 2 to the third power is 8. So what number could we plug in for x to make that parenthesis equal 8? We could go all the way out to 5. And if we plug in 5, 5 plus 3 is 8. That would be log base 2 of 8. And again, 2 to what power would be that value? Well, that would be 3. Let's try plotting these points and see if we can get that kind of parent function curve to look similar to our picture at the bottom. We already have negative 2, 0. We have negative 1, 1. Whoops, maybe. Nope, my eraser was still on. Sorry. There we go. We have 1, 2. Starting to kind of see that curve happen. If we count over to 5 and up 3, we can definitely see that it's going to start to slowly taper off on the right, but still increase. Go ahead and sketch your curve following along the asymptote on the bottom of the graph, and then curving over to the right to finish our function. I had to draw mine through a couple of times. It kind of got smudged in there, but we can see the shape of the graph model the shape of the graph for the parent function. Notice everything moved three to the left, and that's how we described it. 
When your base is two or a number other than 10, some of these graphs are pretty challenging to graph. We have to take our time figuring out what numbers to plug in. Over on the right, however, f of x is going to be pretty reasonable to work with f of x equals negative log x minus 3. Notice there's no base written in. That means this is going to be base 10. That means we can plug things in on our calculator, which will be very nice. Let's look at our transformations. We have a negative out in front. That negative is going to reflect the graph over the x-axis. So that's going to change what the final shape of our graph looks like. Notice the x and then the minus 3. It's significant to note that the 3 isn't in parentheses. That means that it's not moving right or left, it's actually moving down 3. Parentheses are significant. We've talked about that all throughout the year, but no more meaningful than what we need for this graph. So it moves down 3 units. Those are our descriptions, our, our descriptions for our transformation. Now let's take a look at some of those key characteristics. The domain. Notice the domain, we don't have an x minus h, we just have log of x. That's our base logarithm term. This means x is going to just be greater than or equal to zero, like the parent function. Ooh, but I want that in a different color. I want to try to stay consistent. So x is going to be greater than zero. There we go. Our range for logarithms always defaults to our output is equal to all real numbers. Our x-intercept, this is where we've got to do some work. We set the entire equation equal to zero. Negative log x minus three equals zero. And now we have to solve for x. Step one is to isolate your logarithmic term. That means we have to isolate this much on the left-hand side. I'm going to do that by moving three over. And then we have to get rid of that negative sign. I'll divide both sides by negative one. We get log of x equals negative three. And now we have to loop it. Remember, the base is 10 because nothing's written in that spot. What power are we going to raise that to? The negative third power, of course. And what will it equal? It will equal x. Oh, to simplify that, that's 1 over 10 to the positive 3 or 1 over 1,000. That's our x-intercept. Ah, all right, we got to deal with it. Our asymptote then? If the domain didn't change, our asymptote doesn't change from our parent function either. x equals 0. All right, let's plot some key features and then make a table to finish this lesson. So far, I plotted our asymptote at x equals 0 and a very poor attempt at trying to graph the x-intercept at 1 one-thousandths, or 0 0.001 on the x-axis. That doesn't give us a whole lot to work with. Let's create a table and see what we can use or how we can use our calculator to help us come up with these answers. We know that one one thousandth gives us zero. Let's see what else we can do. If we move to the right, plugging in one, you literally can type this all in on your calculator. Negative log one minus three, and you get an answer of negative three. So at one, we're all the way down to negative three. If you plug in 2, negative log 2 minus 3, I got negative 3.3. So at negative 2, it gets a little bit lower. Whoops, over here a little. Well, maybe not. All right, over here somewhere. And if you plug in, go all the way over to 10. Let's just get crazy. Go all the way over to 10. Negative log 10 minus 3 only puts us down to negative 4, so 10 down to negative 4. I can see that there's a curve happening with this shape, but notice it's upside down. Now when we sketch our graph, we're going to follow it from the top of the graph along the asymptote, 
through those four points and have it end up curving over to the right. And your graph will hopefully look something like this. I know it's a little obnoxious looking. Remember, we said it reflected over the x-axis and it kind of curves in the opposite direction, so that makes sense. We also said the graph moved down three units and it kind of looks like we've gone a little bit further below the graph than we normally would. So I think we've done a fair sketch of our graph for this transformation. And we've taken plenty of time to get through it. So that will be all we cover for notes today. Please take a picture and upload for your homework credit.